All right, fart news. First of all, I'm gonna be straight up and be like, yo, we just finished a podcast with your with you so money podcast, and I'm so excited for everyone to listen to that. However, I'm so excited for you to be on Trust and Believe because I feel like right now. People are having a hard time trusting and believing in their money, which also kind of filters into their life. So Farnoosh Torabi is here to help us understand money and how to maybe stress less. Farnoosh, can you give me a little background about yourself, help people understand where you come from when it comes to money? Wow. Well, I think the best place to start, and thank you so much for having me on your show. You're such an inspiration, Sean. Um, and thank you for dedicating a whole episode to money. But I, I think the best place to start to kind of explain who I am and why I do what I do is to is to go back into my childhood. You know, I'm a daughter of immigrants. My parents came here from the Middle East, Iran, um, with a lot of ambition, a lot of work ethic. We were not well off growing up. My father was a you know, a grad student. My mother didn't work. So he was making like a small stipend and we lived in Worcester, Massachusetts. But one of the things that I think was so pivotal in my upbringing that led me to where I am today is, and I think a lot of immigrant families can relate, particularly Middle Easterners, we are not shy talking about money. You know, money is not taboo in our household. We like to talk about money. We're curious about it. We don't think it's inappropriate or rude to ask how much something cost or, you know. And so I think that that um, fluency and that comfort talking about money um, stayed with me for my whole life. And then when I got older and had to kind of figure out what my grown up job was going to be, like you, first and foremost, I wanted something that I could be in service to others. I could be helpful. That is number one. And then you know, along the way, you got to think about, well, specifically, how are you going to help people? And I think going back again to money, I realized there was such a need to help people with their money, in particular, young people. I've been doing this for, you know, a long, long time, 17 years. And uh, I immediately recognized that, yeah, the financial advice is out there, but it's not really being provided in a way that is digestible, accessible, relatable to young people, especially. And, you know, now those young people have grown up with me, so we're not so young anymore. But I think that that's kind of how I understood it and how I wanted to make a difference, combining my passion for helping people with my um, comfort level, talking about money and realizing just how important money is at the end of the day. When you talk about money, you're talking about life. It's everything. Yeah, I actually really like how you said your family isn't afraid to talk about money. I think because I grew up on government assistance and not having money, for me, I actually like talking about it because it motivates and inspires me, not from a materialistic standpoint, but I believe that when you actually talk about money, you get out there not only where you are now in terms of how much money you make or your investments, but you then start to talk about how to make more money, which I believe then turns into talking about, if you're talking about how, let's talk about your passion. Or some people are like, well, I just want to have different businesses and that could be a passion. And so I think that that's all really great. And I'm glad you like to talk about money because we're about to talk about some money, honey. Okay, good. (laughs) And by the way, love that you like to talk about how to make it because so often the conversation is about what to give up right? How to cut the coupons and save. And I think that's all good. Like budgeting is important. Being smart with your money is important. But often we forget that there's so much more potential when you think bigger and you think about how can I go out there and actually make more money, get the raise, start the business and be more in control of it as opposed to, you know, feeling like you're constantly living a life of deduction. Mm, I love that. Yes. And I definitely want to talk about money, but before we talk about making money, I mean, I definitely want to talk about how to make money. But before we talk about that, you know, let's talk about the not really the elephant in a room, which is what's happening in the world right now, which is the pandemic and how it has really affected our economy. Now, 
I know it's always on the news, different channels, be it MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, all of the maybe your local news too. But a lot of people don't listen to the news. And a lot of people are just maybe on social media and they're reading articles and they don't hear it from someone's mouth. So can you let people know what is happening in society right now and what is happening right. with our economy? Sure. So it starts with the health crisis, right? This pandemic is having domino effects in all realms of life. Firstly, it's threatening our livelihood, our health. And that is um, the level to which this has become, has gotten the spread, uh, the fatalities is, you know, in our lifetime, unprecedented. And quickly it escalated to the point where, you know, it was deemed unsafe to be close to people in proximity to people. So when governments, state governments started to impl imp implement the shelter in place, right? What did that mean? Essentially, you couldn't go to work. And if you can't go to work, you can't make money. And so very quickly, this pandemic had a massive domino effect across multiple industries that were not ready for it. And these businesses that don't have, just like individuals, the rainy day accounts, right? They may have enough to tie them over a week or two or a month of not making money, but we don't know when this is gonna end. And, and so very quickly, a lot of businesses had to shut down. I'm talking about, you know, hospitality, restaurants, places where they weren't really online. Like maybe you could order a sandwich online from the restaurant, but most of the business was on site. Um, doctor's offices, lawyers, teachers. And so you get the picture, right? It's, it's 22 million people in the last three weeks were recording this um, in mid-April are newly unemployed. That's on top of the people who are already unemployed in this country. And so unemployment's a huge um, aftershock of this pandemic, and we think it's gonna continue sadly. Um, and so that has led to many people and entrepreneurs and businesses alike um, strapped, and uh, it's devastating. And you know, a lot of people are comparing this devastation, economic devastation to the recession 10 years ago, which was caused by a completely different thing. And, and that's important to differentiate. Like what caused the Great Recession in 2008 was, um, you know, the housing bubble crashing and um, a lot of players within the financial industry um, not playing with a full deck of cards, you know, just to keep it simple and that having a huge domino effect. And back then, different types of devastation happen. We had you know, people losing their homes. Yes, unemployment skyrocketed, but this is, I think, in some ways, a lot harsher. The immediacy of it, you know, uh, like basically overnight, lights turned off, businesses can't function. And, you know, I think about small businesses like restaurants in particular, like so much of their revenue is tied to you, know, you going inside and sitting at a table and their profit margins are maybe 10% if they're lucky, mm. right? And maybe if they have a couple weeks reserved, they're lucky. And a lot of these businesses depend on debt financing to grow. And, and now they can't pay the bills, they can't pay their workers, let alone their debts. And so that's um, what's happening. But I think on the flip side, the reality is, is we're all in this together, right? Everyone is suffering to some extent, some worse than others, but the government has now no choice but to step in and inject money into our economy to help people get back on their feet. We had a $2.2 trillion stimulus plan that was passed recently. We think it's gonna even be more money down the road uh, out of necessity because people need unemployment benefits, um, people who didn't typically qualify for unemployment, now they can. People like part-time workers and gig workers, um, furloughed workers. Um, there's a whole payment, uh, there's a paycheck protection plan for small businesses that's quickly drying up. You know, millions of dollars potentially to your business is as a loan, then maybe a, as, a, as a grant eventually. And so there's this immediate sort of knee-jerk reaction from the government, which is good to see, but I'm, I think there's gonna have to be more because um, this is just, it's just bad, and, but it's not just bad. I mean, I think, look, looking back at the other recession that we had 10 years ago, so much innovation came out of that, right? I got unemployed in the last recession. I lost my job and that immediately forced me out of necessity to start my own business. Um, 
truth is I was thinking about doing it, but I was taking my time. I wasn't feeling the, the necessity, but then the choice was made for me. I couldn't go back to my old job. So sometimes the best choices in life are the ones that are made for you because it's going to make you do the thing that you always told yourself you were going to do. And now you have to do it. And I think there's going to be an entrepreneurial boom in this country. Already we're hearing about a lot of businesses that had these goals, they're getting accelerated now because they just have to, right? They have to build the technologies. They have to invest in these certain areas to just keep head above water and somehow come out of this hole. But um, we can talk more about it because I think that's really where you have to focus. You can't, you don't want to focus too much on the negative because that's just going to keep you down. You got to think about how you can actually seize the moment in some ways and identify what people need and how you can service that so that you can, you know, you can, you can grow in this, in this time period and look back and say, you know, um, this was actually a pivotal time for me. Yeah. I have a question too, because that obviously makes a lot of sense and it helps me understand. Now let's talk about now. I'm not a finance major, nor am I an expert like you. So these questions, I know, I know you probably have the thing. No question is a stupid question. So I'm going to ask anyway. You know, we hear, you know, the U.S. is America is a powerful country. It's a powerhouse. And so if we don't have people working and I hope I can ex ask this correctly, if we don't have people working and we print our own money and we're pushing money into the economy, how is that not affecting our global uh, uh, financial power? You know, sure. how does that work? Well, you know, I'm not a macroeconomics professor, but I will say that, yeah, that's a valid concern. You know, like, how can we just print money and then expect that life's going to go back to normal? Um, because now we're saying, like, there could be inflation and all of the other things. But everybody, including other countries, are in this boat, mm. right? Let's remember that, that every country is injecting money into their economies right now. So you can make the argument that, yes, the United States is, you know, um, reducing its sort of financial position in the world because it's kind of working backwards right now, trying to save its country, trying to save jobs and all the things. But that's going to come back to the, our country through the form of tax dollars. Like the U.S., the American consumer is paying for this stimulus. Let's not forget, like over time. And if you go back into the re last recession, um, and I hate comparing it to the Great Recession because this is so different. But in some ways, we can make some parallels. You know, in the last tr recession, we had a $600 billion stimulus plan. And even then, people were like, how is this not going to lead to higher taxes, inflation? But the, the economy absorbed it, mm. and people used that money and reinvested it into the economy and built new infrastructure, new technologies, new... I mean, so many companies were born out of the last recession. Uber, right? Airbnb, all these, all these businesses that, um, well, now they're hurting again. But it's, it's important to remember history a little bit to give you the context about what could happen in the future. I'm not saying that there isn't going to be inflation, but there's also an argument that this first two trillion dollars that we injected into the economy, it's not enough. It's going to get absorbed really fast and then we're still going to need more. Um, and I don't like to focus too much on the future because right now there's such a tsunami happening. Like I just feel like we have to do what we have to do to, to make sure that people can not just survive, but try to thrive right now, you know, despite everything. So speaking of what can we do, I mean, there are people right now who were going to work and then the next day, like you said, they can't go to the restaurants, they can't go to the gyms. As a, as a, as a person, I'm not a personal trainer anymore, but as someone in the health and fitness space, you know, obviously I'm lucky enough to have my online business already set, but there are people out there who went to a gym every day and they were banking on making money from clients coming in and then personal training or them being group exercise instructors. And like I said, the service industry, you know, people who may have done stuff at hotels, you know, event planners. What what can they do right now? Like, yeah. what is the thing, you know, like because that's very stressful to a lot of people. It is. 
Well, firstly, applying for unemployment is a no-brainer. I hope everybody does this. And like I mentioned earlier, there's because of the stimulus plan, there is an allowance for more people to apply that wouldn't traditionally qualify. So if you are self-employed, if you were a part-time worker, um, gig worker, you know, you can apply now. And on top of that, you'll get a $600 check from the federal government. You'll get your state's unemployment to some extent, and then you'll get the federal government's additional $600 a week until the end of July, oh. which might even get extended at this point because, you know, we're just, remember this stimulus plan, 2.2 trillion, the initial proposal was a $6 trillion plan. So I have a feeling there's still money left to put back into the economy. So I, I'm hopeful that there'll be more in the down the pipeline, but low hanging fruit, apply for the unemployment, get what you're already paid into, and hopefully that'll help to replace some of your income. Now, for a lot of people, that's not gonna be, it's not gonna make them whole, you know? Um, so then it's about thinking, how can I pivot to the internet? And you're the master at this, but let's just stick with somebody who is in fitness. You know, I used to go to a bar class every other day in New York City, and can't go there anymore. And all those people who worked there still work there. A lot of them. What have they done? This is so smart. The first, I would say two to three weeks of the shelter in place, they started doing live Instagram workouts for free for their, all their Instagram followers at 9 AM, 12 PM, like around the clock. Now that they, they've gotten this loyalty, right? People thinking, Oh, I can't work, work out from home, but now I can, because it's so easy through this bar class on Instagram, they've started a private community on Instagram where you pay for exclusive workouts with your favorite instructors. Because what part of why people went to this place wasn't just the workout, it was the instructors. And they're missing out on that motivation and that coaching and that inspiration. And so I don't know if that was always the plan was to transition now to a paid model on Instagram and on Facebook. but. It's, you know, it's, and again, for that business, it's not gonna make them whole, but it's better than nothing. And then you supplement that with some of the government subsidies, it's better than nothing, and you're not gonna have to face massive layoffs. So it's thinking about how can I take my existing skill set and transfer it to the internet. Artists, another great example, if you're a performance artist and you were performing on the stage or on camera, on, on a studio, um, or you're a painter and you have the galleries that you were going to, uh, how, what do you do now? So I hear a lot from my own community, the, my So Money podcast community, they're extremely ambitious and they're um, just, they, they don't uh, take no for an answer, but they're telling me what they're doing. One person who's a musician is teaching guitar lessons online to kids. Why are kids a great demographic right now? Because you know, as a parent, I'm a parent too, all our kids are home getting homeschooled, but mm -hmm. the parents are still working. So who's actually teaching the kids? And so any way that you can create supplemental and rich programming for kids online, um, you're in business. We watch uh, an artist at 12 o'clock go live every day. Um, and she has a great new art project for my kids every day. She has a Kickstarter, so we contribute to that. So it's it's, it, this is how people are making do right now. And I will say that if you've not been transitioning to the internet for your business fully yet, let this be your opportunity. You know, I think that um, what we're seeing is just an acceleration of goals right now. People are like, oh yeah, I was going to start that course. I was going to start that podcast. I was going to start that, you know, Instagram feed. And now you have to, because it's the only way you're going to continue to have a, an impact in yeah. this economy. Um, um, well, I don't think any of this is great, <laughs> but it, like you used earlier, we were talking, you know, it's a pivotal time for you to really start to set yourself up for success later. And I don't think that a lot of people are realizing that, uh, kind of like you said, with the recession back in 2008, Uber, Airbnb came about, this is the time where you can literally say, I'm going to stay consistent in this one thing that I was going to do and now I have the time to do to push forward. Um, so one of the things that, you know, trying to build a business is great. And I want to ask you about your building of your business, the 
last time we went through our recession because I want to know about that. But before we get there, we need to, I think this is the perfect time now to help people learn how to save money and what are some motivational tips yes. that you have for people to save money? Because I was actually talking to um, a friend of mine who is in finance as well. And all of her friends, she used to say, don't go out to happy hour every night. You should have your emergency fund or whatever people call mm -hmm. it. And they didn't. And they're calling her saying, I should have listened. Yeah. Yeah. I really hope that after this, saving money is going to be fashion. You know, we're going to wear it like it's in season. You know, we're not going to be so um, show offy about what we own, but what's in the bank account. Um, a girl can dream, Sean. Okay. <laughs> right, but um, I think that, look, have you looked at your credit card statement recently? Uh, if your credit card bills have gone up, what are you doing with your time? If anything, your credit card bill should be slashed in half right now Yo, because you're not leaving. I literally, if I just say this, I have not used my credit card, but for a couple things on Amazon to keep my boys entertained. Yes. But my, I'm, I'm actually going to ask Scott that question when we finish. I yeah. literally believe that my... I'm not even 20, not even 20% of what I would spend. No, I, I mean, you're not doing all the frivolous spending that you were where you'd go out, a lot of senseless stuff, right? You go out, you get the coffee, you buy the magazine, you, you know, this, that, the other thing, you come home and you've spent 80 bucks and you can't even remember how you did it. And it happens to the best of us. I think a good exercise for everybody right now, step number one, go check your credit card statement. Your most recent credit card statement probably um, will be at some point overlapping with the quarantine and the shelter in place and compare it to January. How much money did you save just because you didn't leave your house? Now, life will change and we will leave our house one day and you're not gonna have these savings levels um, in the future, but it's sobering and it's really educational to see just how much you were spending on those Ubers and on those little things that were adding up. Um, and for us, it's been a real wake up call because you're realizing what you can do without. You know, some of the stuff you really miss, you know, go back to paying for those things and I, and I want the economy to revive. So I'm not saying to everybody stop spending forever, but it's gonna really make you think twice about some of the things that you were spending on, or at least how much you were spending on certain things. And I think this is a great time to learn how to do with less to, to get more done. I'm learning how to cook right now, Sean. <laughs> like <laughs> before the quarantine, I could hard boil an egg and maybe like make some pasta. But now I'm like really actually interested in learning new recipes. Um, and I think that going forward, this is something that will stick with our household. We're not going to be ordering in as much. And I look forward to that. But I think that's going to be a good first step for everyone just to get really intimate with the spending and how much you're actually doing okay with right now, not spending on all of these things and taking notes. And then step number two, what else can you reduce beyond that? And we know that right now the money isn't going to arrive at your doorstep. The discounts, the savings aren't going to knock on your door. You need to go out there and ask for the discounts, ask for the, the payment deferments on your rent, on your credit card bills. And this is happening. You know, anecdotally, we know, and also companies have put out statements, banks, credit card companies saying, if you're in trouble, don't miss a payment and not tell us, call us, be proactive about it. Let us know you're losing your job or you just lost your job or your partner lost his or her job and your income as a household has diminished. And they have programs set aside during hard economies and especially right now. So I know that for example, I'm in a business with two other women. In addition to my own business, I'm a co-founder in another business. We have a small business loan and my co-founders have both lost their jobs, their day jobs. So as a company, we called our bank where we have this business loan and they said, it was, it was a phone call. They said, we, don't forget about your loan for the next three months. Wow. Like the payment's not going to go away forever, but they're going to tack those three months onto the, the balance of the loan. And so that's giving my co-founders a lot of breathing room to not have to make this payment every month for the time being. And this is happening across the board with credit cards, with landlords doing this for their tenants. You actually have a lot of leverage right now. It may seem like nothing is in your control, but I want to tell your audience this. You do have 
the ability to negotiate right now. Because let's just take rent, for example, here. Um, your landlord hopefully is calling their mortgage company and getting some sort of you know, relief in the form of p- payment deferment or what have you. So hopefully he or she does this and now can now give this benefit to you in the form of you not paying your rent for the next two or three months. But you should initiate this conversation with your landlord because I don't think landlords are making these phone calls uh, you know, across the board. Some are, but it's really you as the tenant to call and say, I can't work or I lost my job um, and then have a proposal in mind. Suggest something like, you know, half rent or what I was, you know, not paying until July and then renegotiating. Nobody can move right now, Sean. So if you're at the end of your lease, now's a really good time to renegotiate for a shorter, a smaller payment every month or maybe a month free or three months free because your landlord's going to have a pretty impossible time replacing you right now in this shelter uh, in place mandate. And, and so that's another bit of leverage that you may have to say, look, I'm looking to get back on my feet. I'm collecting unemployment, this, the, the other thing. I would like to stay here and they can't evict you because there's a lot of, there's eviction moratoriums happening in many, many States. I'm in New York can't evict you uh, for now. So that is leverage for you. And then calling up like your car insurer, because you're not driving either. Why should you be paying just as much in insurance? And insurance companies are setting aside discounts for people who've lost their jobs or they're, they just ask, they just ask for it. And they're like, here, here's 15% off. Yeah, I know I it's not a lot, that. Yeah, but if, if less people are driving, less accidents are happening. Less accidents, yeah. less wear and tear all the things. So yeah, it it just, the underwriting for that insurance policy is going to look different. And so you shouldn't have to pay what you were paying last month for it. I'm just, I'm like so fascinated by all of this. This is great. Um, Okay. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, I'm going to pick your brain about what you did during the last recession to get you to the place where you are today. All right. We are back with Far News Tarabi. And so Thank you for all of the tips. I mean, the tips you gave so so far are really great. And I think that even for me, I mean, it puts my mind at ease for myself, my business and other people. Uh, you really gave some motivation and insight on, hey, relax a little bit, file for unemployment. You know, there can be, it might not be the money that you're used to have coming in, but used to having coming in, but something's coming. Learning how to communicate with the people that you are going to be in debt to and not just not care about it and think that it's going to go away just like in life in any relationship you have communication is the most important thing so people know where you stand they're all great and i think um i know people are going to be so much less stressed hearing that but it's really about and even though you gave some tips on how to change your what you're currently doing or were doing how to change it to a uh, your business to a virtual virtual space. I want to talk about the last recession because you actually been through this before. You lost your job in 2008. And what were some of the steps that you took to actually build your business to get where you are today? Well, I will say, so in 2009, I got laid off. I think it was in February. My mother had lost her job. I feel like everybody and their sister-in-law had lost their job. I mean, it was like, Kind of the it was kind of on on trend to lose mm. your job, and up until that point, you know, I'd been a full time journalist. I was working as a correspondent for a financial media company, and but along the way, I was sort of you know in a small way building my own personal brand. Before we were calling it a personal brand, this was like two thousand six to two thousand eight. Like you know, I was one of the first people on Twitter, and um, I had written a book. And I'd done some speaking engagements. I was doing more media. And this is all for me, in addition to working full time as a correspondent for this media company. And, you know, in the back of my mind, the, the vision, the dream, the hope was always to strike out on my own, just do more of the, the stuff I was doing on the side full time, like write more books, do more speaking, just become more of a a go-to person for financial advice and not have to worry so much about having an employer and showing up to work every morning, you know, 
the dream. The dream. And, but I was scared. I was scared to make the transition. Now, I was fortunate because all of these side gigs that I was getting, the speaking opportunities, the writing assignments, the book deal, had been helping me strengthen my financial foundation. It helped me get out of debt. I had student loan debt, credit card debt, all of it. It helped me save. And so when I got that pink slip in like February, March of 2009, I, you know, I went through all the stages of grief, you know, denial, feeling bad for yourself, anger, but then ultimately acceptance. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? This has been a gift to me. It doesn't maybe feel like it right now, but I'm going to look at my job right now is to make sure that I look back on this moment in time mm -hmm. as the time when things really started to happen for myself. We tend to forget that there are still things that are within our control right now, right? You keep like talking, you, I'm just doing who something. Who you good. spend your time with, what you focus on, you know, the belief systems that you have, that's all you. And, and I really believe that I, you know, had to just go out and, and strike out on my own now. I had no other choice. Um, it was out of necessity. And, and I had savings. So I wasn't as, you know, I wasn't in the camp where I had to just go back and do another job out of necessity. I could actually take the time. Having savings gave me, afforded me choices, afforded yes. me time to like, okay, take a beat and think about what I wanted to do. And what I did was basically work on myself for the first mm. month. I worked out, I got like my head straight because I, like, to be honest, for the first couple of weeks, I was a mess. I couldn't believe they fired me, couldn't, you know, like I was a star at this place. I was going places. You're like, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? <laughs> and I was really resentful and I was like, okay, over that, you know, like stop playing the blame game. Make the, how are you gonna make this an opportunity? And I remember the day I got laid off, I had scheduled a dinner with a friend and I was thinking about canceling it because I was not in the mood. And he insisted that we keep the dinner date. And at the dinner, he was an entrepreneur. And at the dinner, he ordered a glass of champagne. And he goes, we're gonna have a toast. I said, toast what? I just lost my job. My Blackberry isn't working anymore. And I didn't yeah. back up my emails. You know, this is like, I'm dating myself now. And he goes, no, this is gonna be your moment. This is the, this is the time of your life. Like, seize the moment. So, you know, in hindsight, everything is 2020, but what I did was basically, I worked on myself, I, I had a plan, and I got a teammate to work with me. I, I got to work with, I, I hired basically a manager, an agent, to help me get out there more. Here's the good news, I had a book, right? And I didn't really write the book because I thought I was gonna get laid off and then would need the book to help me kind of build my own platform, but that's mm -hmm. essentially what ended up happening. I lost my job, but nobody could take my book away, and the book had just come out. So it was in some ways um, a blessing in disguise where I had this, I still had, a, I still had something that was mine that I could leverage. And so being it that it was the recession and I was also someone in the advice giving space, the money advice giving space, it was kind of um, a, a perfect storm in some ways, but, but I could have easily just sort of sat on my hands and felt sorry for myself. Mm -hmm. Right. But instead mm -hmm. I said, Nope, I am going to, just go out there and be helpful to people. And I was learning, I was building the plane while I was flying it. I didn't know, you know, like half the things I was, I was getting jobs that I didn't really think I was qualified for, but I took the gig because I was like, I'm going to figure this out. Whether, you know, I got a TV show that year, never done that, but yes, I can do it. Yes. I'm going to figure this out. And, and, you know, things started to happen for me because I was putting myself out there. And I think it's really easy to not do that right instead to feel really scared and intimidated and insecure because what's the first thing you feel when you lose your job you feel uh, bad you feel, feel insecure. Hard, right? your sense of self-worth is zero because we tie so much of our net worth to our self-worth and and I, I think it's really easy to kind of go down that rabbit hole but you have to just I know one of the things you love to say is surround yourself with positive people people that you admire that you want to learn from and I think that's a conscious decision and I feel like I did that and it was helpful for me to get out of my own head and 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 try to create a, a path to success even in the worst of times I think that one of the greatest things like in order to succeed you have to take risks 
And, you know, one of the things I heard before is the risk worth the reward. You know, by taking on these jobs that you didn't think you were qualified for, while you were risking something, the reward was also really great. And like we talked about on your podcast, like sometimes it's okay to fail at something because it helps you understand how much how much more you have to give out, how much more you have to work and how much stronger you have to be. Um, Cause that's obviously one of the major things that's happening right now. Like we are going to find our strength. And even if I can go into real life for a second, like obviously people would be like, oh wow. Like, you know, like some people might say, oh, she has it together. You have all this, but now you're home, you're a parent. Let's talk about the stress of having your own business, now being home with your kids. How are you managing that? Like, I want to know that for myself because I'm a parent as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, we don't we don't have our nanny. Um, she's quarantining and we um, I have a great husband and two of us are just tag teaming, you know, um, a lot, Sean, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is really hard every day. Uh, but we're trying to find the humor in it. Like, my kids sometimes can be really impossible. Like, anytime. Impossible. Impossible. Like, they pick fights with you. They just, they're irrational. I mean, they're chill. They're babies. So what do you expect? But it's, I, like, the other day, my, my daughter was just refusing to do things that were not difficult things. Like, change your clothes. Go to the bathroom. Don't, you know, make a mess of things. And I just started laughing. I don't know if because I was just straight, like at the point of hysteria, but I started to really laugh at the humor. Like well, the joke is on me, right? Like <laughs> don't take it too seriously. That's that's I think that's the message I want to give people is like when you're home and things are just like the dishes are piling up and you can't stand the way your husband's with the sound of his chewing of his food and <laughs> your kids running around the house naked. My kids have discovered that they like to do this. You know, it's like, well, just find the good and humor in it because there's no point in stressing yourself. Don't get worked up about working from home. Yeah. And here's one thing I, I saw this on Twitter and I can't remember who said it. <laughs> you're so funny. I love that you're saying this because I'm going through the same thing, but go ahead. I'm not even, you can't make this stuff up. Um, but someone said to me, let's get this idea of working, that we're working from home out of our heads because we're not. What we're actually doing is we're at home during a crisis, mm. trying to work and trying to take care of our family and trying to cook and clean all the things. But why are we, we're not home because it's easier now to work home from home. No, we're home because there's a crisis. Yeah, we sat down at the dinner table yesterday. And my father-in-law's, I think it'd be 77, like tomorrow. And um, yeah, and I, I just sat down. I was like, listen, I'm overwhelmed like i'm really overwhelmed of having to you know like you you know you give yourself in one area and then for me at least we have the transformation center which is two doors down from my house so we can go back and forth but even when i'm gone you know i'm i'm really concerned about scott because he's taking care of the kids and i'm like i need to try and go relieve him as much as possible and you know it's just like i just wanted to have a conversation about you know, how we feel. But you you said something that was really profound to me, which is like, it is what it is. Basically, you know, you can't, we're trying to work from home. We're, I mean, you know, we're trying to do work at home, which is damn near impossible. Even before I came over to speak with you, one of my kids was having the temper tantrum of life because he wanted to change his outfit before the nap. And I would usually be like, Cause he was like so relentless and being, and I just was like, Scott, I'm out. Like, I'm not even going to like, I'm like, I'm like, no. Oh, I'm all about lowest common denominator. right? <laughs> like, so my son is in kindergarten and he goes to a private school. And I think they feel like they have to overcompensate because we're paying a lot of money and they have to like, they think that like giving us more things to print out and have me do is going to justify the tuition. Please don't send me any more printouts. I don't need homework. My son is five and a half. He'll be fine. But I'm like, I look at his assignments and I'm like, what is absolutely mandatory? That's the one thing we're going to do. And all these optional things, here's an iPad. Yes. I don't have time. I got 
you know, it's, I feel really selfish sometimes when I do that. And I'm like, oh, I'm sacrificing his education. I'm like, no, I'm not. I, mean, I didn't have preschool. You know, I, I, like, I didn't have, you know, two working parents that spent all their time with me. Like I didn't have a lot of the things that he has. So it was a good reminder for parents to think about what did, what did you grow up with? And you turned out okay. And this is just a, just give me a blip on the radar in the grand scheme of life, right? Right, right. Yeah, I think that that's the one thing, you know, even Scott was saying, like, people are like, oh, my God, don't give your kids an iPad. And I'm like, first of all, we speak to, we talk to, we have more conversation with our kids than, I don't, with, with, than with adults, meaning, like, literal conversation. I'm like, if they want an iPad for an hour, you can have the iPad. And I know what they're watching, and it's all educational. So I mean, they're not watching, like, Skinamax. They're watching, like, right. <laughs> great content that we, again we didn't have growing up like pbs kids is basically my babysitter right now yeah i mean like we they watch they play really great amazing games like they it's so anyway i think that one of the reasons why that's important when it comes to money is because a lot of people are working from home and being okay with the fact that this is what we have to do right now like you're doing this at a pan during a pandemic for me i would just tell people just try to find that five, 10, 15 minutes a day to move, to try and get away from them, just to, to get away from work, to, to get your mind and your body in a cohesive unit. So, all right, I have one final question for you, which is um, what I leave my sh all of my shows with, which is how can people trust and believe in who they are in these tough times? Oh my gosh. Um well, I think, again, you got to look at um, how far you've come. You know, if you're where you are today because of hard work and strategy and belief in yourself, um, history repeats. History repeats. Don't forget that. You have what it takes. Um, the key is to be proactive and not reactive. But you have it. That it, you have it. You know, you can, that, that trust and belief in yourself should never be shattered because you have already proven how far you can go. Um, and, and there's more for you ahead. And, and I, I think of that sometimes too when I'm down on my luck and I feel like, oh, this is the end of the road for me. Like I've peaked, you know, my prime time has happened, it's over, curtains shut. And, and then I think, no, I mean, I don't, I, I didn't work this hard for this to be my final moment, mm. for this to be my defining moment, right? This is all about building momentum. And if you can find your stride right now, you will be so much stronger. And you're gonna look back and go, you know what? In some ways, this was the worst thing that could have ever happened to humanity. But in some ways, it was a real wake up call. And I'm so glad that I kept, I, I worked my way through this with my eyes wide open. Yes, um, I appreciate you said you have it because in show business, we have this thing where you walk into the audition where they're like, oh, they have the it factor. And right now, all of you have the it factor. You all have it. You have what it takes to succeed. Farnoosh, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and your honesty. I think that is one of the things that makes me feel really great. It's just what's happening at home and how you're still able to help us thrive through, Brian. especially with finances. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean. Even if you don't like the way your husband chews <laughs> at times. That was a hypothetical. That I know. Fun. Yeah. She loves you, honey. Um, anyway, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. And I'm going to follow you on Instagram. I already do. I'm going to keep on getting that motivation from you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sean.